great to have you here. This, this is great. This church is about four times the size of the church I grew up in. Um, I, uh, when I was a kid, um, elementary school, my family moved to China, and so our church was a handful of people in our living room listening to CDs of worship songs, singing together. And so actually just being in a context like this of going, yeah, we're just the people of God getting together, walking with Jesus, learning how to walk that. So this is really, this is really cool. This is, I really enjoy being here. Um, I, I am a pastor. I'm a counselor. Um, I run um, a company called Church Wellco, which um, exists to create space of brave relationship for pastors and church leaders. Um, and really, all of that aside, really what I care about is the people of God walking in the freedom that Jesus has for them. And I think that there are a variety of reasons that we are saved, that we encounter God, that we get transformed, and then we find ourselves living lives that are inhibited from what God has for us, or we get stuck, or we get turned upside down, uh, we get a little disoriented. And I just believe that when Jesus says, I came that you might have a life and life abundantly, he meant that. And I believe that when Paul says, for it is freedom that you have been set free. I believe that Paul meant that. And I believe that there is a freedom and there is a life that Jesus has for all of us. Um, and in all the work that I do and all the different contexts and the hats that I wear and the places that I go, that, that is what I hold. Um, and so that's what, that's what we're going to engage in a little, bit, a little bit today. I know you guys are in a series on freedom for freedom's sake. And Jesus, may we just draw near to you. Um, may we draw near to you. May we be found in you. And may we walk closely with you. Jesus, may we see you. And Jesus, would we see you seeing us today? That the relationship that you came to bring us, yes, is one where we turn our gaze upon you. And as we do, it is a relationship in which you too are gazing upon us. Jesus, may we see the look in your eyes today as we look to you. May we notice your posture toward us. May we notice your nearness. May we feel your heart toward us even as we offer you our heart. And Jesus, I speak over this time, this, this, these few minutes that I have to share in this community. That Jesus, I know your spirit has already gone before. The Holy Spirit, would you illuminate? Would you draw us out? Would you heal? Would you touch? Would you hold? That we would be people who walk closely with Jesus who are marked by Jesus, who are transformed by Jesus, who are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to walk forth in our world. Jesus, I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. One, one of the, uh, the things that I, that I talk a lot about in, in the work that I do is, is the way that I believe that God from the beginning of time, made us actually for connection with one another. In Genesis chapter 2, uh, paints the creation story. There's this moment where God has created Adam, and he put Adam in the Garden of Eden. And Adam's doing his thing where he's naming all the animals. And, like, as a little kid, I used to, like, think that was so fun. And I pictured Adam just sitting on a rock and all the animals coming up. And I'm like, you are a lion. You are a lizard. And just, like, sitting there, just, like, doting on it. And, um, and, and he would and he knows all these animals had partners. And, and there was this moment where God looked at, at this human he had created and placed in paradise. And, and he looked at this. And, and I, I grew up in a context where I was like, man, all, all I need is Jesus. I can just be with Jesus. And I'm reading this story where Adam is literally walking in paradise with God. And there's this moment where God looks at this and said, actually, it's not good that man would be alone. So in paradise with God, God said, actually, what you also need is another human to be connected with and to walk out a relationship with. And I believe deep in reading that of going, oh, this, this is part of the incompleteness of the way that we engage often as a community, that we were created to be connected with God, 
and we were created to walk in connection with each other. That both of those are coinciding truths. In that when we just live in one without the other, we actually live in incomplete falsehood. And we can look out at our world, and there are people who live in connection with each other and are not connected to God. It's incomplete. And there are many of us in the church who live in connection with God in disconnection from one another, and that is also incomplete. That we were all made to live in connection with God and with one another. So I talk a lot about connection, and I actually asked Cody if he would come uh, help me do a, a little demonstration. So I do a lot of couples work. We talk about relationship. And, and this, this is true of connection with one another. This is also true of connection with God, that, that we are created to be connected. And the way that I picture that is, is almost like I have, I have two little girls at home, and, and I come in, and I'm like, Daddy's home. And they're like, Daddy! And it's like my favorite moment, right? I just walk in and just pure delight, and their arms go wide open. They're like, they just run in for a hug, and there's this experience like, I want to be connected to you. And I actually think that's a picture of how God created us to operate. This arms wide open, heart exposed, say, I want to see you. Would you see me? Would you engage me? Let me come and let us be connected. So actually, in relationship, we start like this. Or you think about your romantic relationship. This is falling in love. Oh, man, I see your heart. You see my heart. This is when we encounter Jesus and go, man, I am open. There's a connection to you that we can engage. And then there are things in our lives that cause pain, that get us spun out that make it difficult to remain this way. Like, like, we can walk this way. You get punched in the gut a few times. You don't walk around like this anymore. You get knocked in the face, you start to do some other protective posture. You start to do some different things. And so, for example, if you got gut punched, how are you going to protect yourself? Okay, so, so this, this is what we all, we all do this. We all have moments. Where we'll take that stance. Maybe, and maybe for some it's like that. Maybe some people, we talk about like the fight, flight, freeze response. And we think about our biological wirings. And some people just like freeze and lay on the floor. And they're like, I'm just going to pretend that this isn't happening. And just blow over me. And some people are like, let's go. And some people will kind of turn around and walk away. But t so take that stance again. Okay? Now I want you to imagine he's taking a stance like this. Yeah. And I want a hug. How's this going to go? Poorly, right? Because the reality is we cannot embrace someone and protect ourselves from them at the same time. We have to choose one. Thank you, Cody. Great. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you for the demonstration. Right? We, we can only do one of those. And there's this tension that we walk in often where we are created to be engaging like this with God. And we're created to be engaging like this with one another. But we have these experiences that go like, ah, I don't know if I trust you. And we have people in our past and in our lives and in our present who go, yeah, that's not a trustworthy person. And so this isn't, please don't hear me that like we all must walk around. There's actually some people that you probably shouldn't do this with. Uh, there's some people that carry their own pain and walk around slinging their pain on other people. So please do not hear me saying, oh, we need to, we, what we learned at church today is we just need to walk around and let everyone in and let everyone see. No, no, there's wisdom. There's wisdom and caution and we can't cannot forget that what God created us for was to experience connection with God and with one another. So what I want to talk about today is actually two particular kinds of experiences that I watch we as followers of Jesus that tend to cause us to move from a place of love where we're ready to connect, we're experiencing connection, where I am seeing the heart of God and God is seeing my heart and I'm seeing your heart and you're seeing my heart and walking in deep relationship with one another. And there's two particular kinds of experiences that consistently I watch as it causes us as followers of Jesus to move back to a place where we start to protect ourselves. And actually part of the difficulty with protecting ourselves is we actually create a barrier between our own heart and the heart of God. God can say, I, I don't know if you've ever had someone come and try to give you a hug when you are not in a hugging mood. Right? There are moments like you, you someone comes, you're like, do not, do not hug me. And someone comes up and gives you a hug anyways. And it is just like, Wah. <laughs> some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you know. Okay, cool. We're on the, we're on the same page. Not just, not just me. Or some of you tried to give someone a hug who didn't want to be hugged. And it was like, ooh, that was the wrong move. Right? You may not have known it until you hugged them. And then they just go, Vroom. or they just go limp. And you're like, I don't hug me. And they like fall out, fall out of the bottom of the hug. 
right? Like these experiences, because if I'm not in a hugging mood, there's very little you're going to do to get me to be in a hugging mood. And you trying to hug me harder is not going to make me want that hug anymore. It actually makes, makes me start to fight you, right? We think about parents with our kids, and sometimes we get real worried, and we try to like force this connection with our kids, and our kids just get angry and fight. Yeah, because when we are in a place where we're starting to protect ourselves, actually the only one who can move us from that place is us. We are the ones who shifted from here to here, and we are the ones who then make this choice to go back to here. So as we talk about freedom and the freedom that Jesus has for us to actually walk like this and to know each other, to be known by each other, to know God and be known by God, and to walk in deep, empowering connection that allows us to walk bravely into the world and see the kingdom of Jesus show up on our earth. And it's people who walk like this. When I was a kid, um, before my family moved to China, so I was five, six years old, uh, we lived in, in rural New York, which I know for many sounds like an oxymoron, um, but it was western part of the state, far away from the city. So it actually lived in, it, was, it looked a lot, it, was, it was, lived on a little farmhouse, and we had, there was a, some big lakes around in, in the Finger Lakes area, and we had a, we had a houseboat um, that was really cool to stay on in the middle of the lake and hang out at, but moved at a snail's pace. And my friends who had cooler, nicer boats would go flying by on the tubes, and I'm sitting on the back of the boat going, bub, 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 through the lake. <laughs> but we would spend a lot of time in the summer out on this boat. Uh, my dad was pissed most of the time because something was breaking and he was trying to fix it. And so I'm there in the water, and he's covered in grease and all, all of that kind of thing. But there were some nights, like some of my fondest memories is laying um, – the, the, there was like the, the back of the boat was where like kitchen and dining room that then the table came down and that became the bed and you walk up the stairs and there's like the cabin and the, the steering wheel. Um, and so the, in the cabin, that was where my parents, they would convert it into a bed. And so I remember there was a couple of nights where I'm sitting on the bed and kind of there's a pillow there and I'm kind of laying up on the pillow and watching the storm happen across the lake. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to watch like a lightning storm on a lake where you just have this open space that has these dark skies and clouds and just this lightning filling up the sky. And maybe because it was like five and maybe it wasn't like as grand as it is in my memory. But man, when I think back to that, I'm sitting in the storm, laying on my dad's bed, sitting on his pillow, watching the storm just light up the sky. And how incredible of a moment that was. And then I think about how differently I tend to experience storms times with Jesus. And actually, there's a story in the Gospels I, I want to read I want to read together today, and I think we have that um, passage up here on the screen. And if not, I can read it. Do we, do we grab that? Oh, there we go. So this is, Jesus is with his disciples. Um, and so the story says that on that day, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, hey, let's go, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were there with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke up, they woke up, they woke him and said to him, Teacher, uh, I should raise my tone because this goes out like, Hey, teacher, are you okay? Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Don't you care that we're going to die? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? I think about the experience I had as a little kid on that boat with my dad. And then I read this story. And it's interesting because in both situations, there were boats. In both situations, there were storms. In both situations, there were pillows. And those two stories are very different stories. When I read this story, sometimes I wonder, and this is just when I read the Bible and I'm reading scripture, I want to know what it says, and then it also, the, the way the Holy Spirit works, it invites us to, to think about and to imagine what the scenario is, and there's a lot in the stories that isn't, all the information isn't always there, and we sit and go, okay, I, I wonder how this, 
how is, what was going on in the story? So I read this story, and I actually try to, I picture it in my mind like I would be watching a movie. And, and there's Jesus on his pillow. Like he brought a pillow. He brought a pillow. He brought a pillow. No one else brought a pillow. Maybe they should have been paying attention to what Jesus was bringing. He brought a pillow, and he's on the bed. A storm comes up, and the disciples panic. I mean, this is a moment. They just were walking through moments of seeing Jesus do miracles and walk with things and the connection that they were having. And the storm came up, and the disciples immediately went to this. And we know that they were protecting themselves because they started accusing Jesus. Jesus, don't you care about us? Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? The disciples started accusing Jesus because when we begin to protect ourselves, we actually lose our ability to see the heart of the other. When the disciples began to protect themselves, they could no longer see Jesus' heart. And when they couldn't see Jesus' heart, questions like, don't you care that we're going to die? Like, when we're in a place of connection, when we can see Jesus' heart, that's an absurd question. Jesus, don't you care that we're going to pray? Yeah, yes, that's literally why he left heaven and came to earth, because he cares that we are about to perish. Jesus, don't you care that we're going to perish? And they moved in this place of protection. Sometimes I wonder when I read this story if the way that it might have actually played out for Jesus is he's on the cushion, sleeping in the storm, which storms actually in a way are kind of miraculous things when you think about what is happening and the beauty. And it's scary and unsettling and disruptive and, and, and also actually really kind of beautiful. Like the storms that we just had these last couple weeks and I took my girls downstairs. We had a nice big window, and we just sat. We just watched the storm roll in. And Jesus is on his cushion. The storm is coming up. Disciples freaking out and waking up. And sometimes I wonder if, if actually how it might have played out is Jesus waking up and going, I really wish we could just watch the storm together. But I guess because you're panicking and I care about you, okay, the waves, knock it off, wind, chill out. Not because Jesus actually wanted to or Jesus even needed to or was trying to prove a point, but actually because his disciples freaked out in the storm and they wanted to escape the storm instead of experience intimacy with Jesus. And I watch consistently in my own life. I watch consistently as others who are walking with Jesus reach a place of a storm, and, and they can come into a storm like this. Jesus, I'm walking with you. I'm connected to you. And a storm shows up in our life. Right? A loved one dies. Marriage starts to get rocky. People we care about are in hard times. Things happen to like, there are plenty of storms that show up in our world. And a storm shows up. And we were living like this with Jesus. We were living like this with our community. And a storm shows up. And we start to protect ourselves. And we lose access to our visual of the heart of the person, the heart of God. And we start to freak out. And God is just like, I just want to lay on a pillow with you. Would you bring your pillow? Put your pillow here on the bed beside me. Sit and watch the storm that's happening around you because I am here with you and I am your freedom. Sometimes as Christians, we forget that Jesus is our freedom and we think that the calming of the storm is our freedom. Storms are hard. They're unsettling. They can be scary. They can be threatening. And they are invitations for us as followers of Jesus to choose intimacy and connection with Jesus, not just escape from a difficult thing. And the experience of sitting on a boat with your head on a pillow, watching a lightning storm with your dad, I actually know what that's like. And it's pretty incredible. then the next storm comes and I freak out and I forget and I get scared and I protect myself and I don't see the heart of the Father. And I don't see the heart of Jesus and the beauties of each of us. And Jesus goes, why are you so afraid? 
We all need to be scared of the storm. Turn your pillow. Watch it with me. Be close to me. And so storms are really consistently a spot where in my own life and those that I walk with cause us to move from this place that Jesus has made us to be and Jesus gave his life that we could return to and invites us to learn to walk and storms come up and it moves us from here to here. And the invitation here is to bring a pillow, find Jesus, and sit with Jesus in the hard thing. And it may be, it may be in that story that had the disciples done that, and the storm got a little out of control, Jesus may yet have stood up on the boat and said, hey, waves and wind. Like, hey, stop messing with my people. Like, we're, we're going to ride this out. And so it may have actually led to the same thing and come to the same conclusion, but the disciples missed the opportunity to watch a storm come up. May we not miss those opportunities. Uh, when I was in college, um, I had this experience with God where uh, – I was, I was really trying to reintegrate and re-engage my own faith in what it meant to follow Jesus. And so I was sitting and I was like talking to Jesus and go, hey, Jesus, what, what do you want from me? Like, what, 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 do you, what do you need me to do? And, and he gave me these pictures um, of like mathematical pie charts. And I'm not a real math person. So not, I have like poetry and beautiful things and art and tell stories and um, not things that are linear and go in a straight line and let's just like move through the world and create a beauty and glory. And so I noticed when, when a picture of mathematical pie chart showed up in my mind, I was like, okay, I, there is a good possibility that this is God. Um, not normally how my brain works. And so I saw this picture of this pie chart, and, and one, one pie chart um, had, like, the, the pizza slices. Um, and in each of the slices on the pie chart was, like, a different part of my life. It was, like, Serving in youth group and going to school and friendship and I had a girlfriend at the time and like these different parts of my life and, and God showed me this pie chart and then he showed me this other pie chart that like had those but then over top of it was just like one big circle that just said God and God said hey I, I don't want to just be a piece of your life I want to be your whole I don't want to be a piece of your pie I want to be the whole pie and it was this moment I was like hey great yes I want that too let's do that and so I like Took that moment, and I started walking away, and I was like, actually, um, rewind. Can we, hold on, hold on, come, come, come back. And one of the things that I'm, I don't always catch things, but I was really glad I caught this one because it dawned on me, conceptually, I get that. You don't want to be, you don't just want to be a piece of my pie, you want to be a whole pie. But I rewind it, and I was like, God, what does that mean? Like, I, I get it. I get it. You don't want to be a part of my life. You want to be a whole life. But, like, what, what does that mean? Like, am I supposed to break up with my girlfriend and leave my church? And, like, am I, am I eliminating these pieces of the pie so that, like, literally it is just you and me? And now I know Genesis and connection with God and connection with the other. That actually it's all integrated and all interwoven and all of those things. And I'm sitting and going, I, like, I know that this is true. And I know that God is asking this of me. I actually, I don't actually know what it means. And so God didn't really respond in that moment, which kind of annoyed me. So I'm like, that would, would have been helpful. And so I, but I sat with this of going, okay, if this is a word that God gave me, then God knows what this means. And if this is what God is asking me to do, then God knows how I'm supposed to do this. So I'm just going to wait till God tells me what this means. And so I had a, an 8.30 class. I don't know why I had an 8.30 class, a five-day week class in college. It was like a terrible idea. Yeah, Right? No idea why. It just happened to be, and maybe it was all God's providence because it, I sat and had an 8.30 class, and the building was right next door to a building where there was a chapel in it. I said, okay, I will just go to the chapel before class, before I start next week. I said, okay, if I'm going to start class, I'll just, I'll just go, spend a little time before class, and show up. And so I went into the chapel. It was just this dark, dimly lit chapel where I'm sitting, and it's quiet, and it's dark. So I'm sitting there, okay, God, got my notebook out ready to, like, take notes of, like, as God maps out for me what are the steps I need to take. And I sat there, five minutes, ten minutes, nothing. Now my thoughts start coming up, and now I'm, like, fighting my thoughts. I'm, like, get out of here. I'm trying to hear God and all this in 15 minutes and 20 minutes and 25 minutes. And 30 minutes came and went, and I had to go to class, and I did not hear a thing. 
other than my own thoughts. And then I was frustrated. I was like, I'm literally trying to get God to speak to me about what God spoke to me about already that I don't understand. Nothing. So I showed up on that Monday, got nothing. Showed up on that Tuesday, got nothing. Showed up on that Wednesday, got nothing. The whole first week, 30 agonizing minutes every morning, that entire week. Showed up going, I, I don't understand what is, like it was, it was unpleasant. I'm literally just sitting in the dark hearing nothing. One week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, three months, five days a week, 30 minutes, in the dark, nothing happened. The semester ended, I was kind of pissed at God. I, I don't know what more I can do to demonstrate to you how much it matters to me that I would walk with you the way that you've asked me to walk with you. I don't know what else you want from me. I don't know what else I can do. It felt like this whole period of time where I was one, just sitting in the dark alone. And then I went home, and home was still China at that time. And it was like three weeks after I was home. And I'm walking through my city, a city that I've been in for years, seeing the things I've seen for years. And I, I found, I started noticing myself noticing things. I started noticing that you know, I walked by this little girl selling flowers and started finding myself wondering, man, I wonder what her story is. I wonder how she got there. And in, in where I'm from, if a little girl is selling flowers on the street, that is slavery and that is... Um, kidnapping, and that is a, that's a whole, it's a whole backstory of pain and, and ugliness. And so I just found myself wondering about what her story was and where she slept at night. And then I kept walking, and I passed a, a homeless guy and started wondering. And, and I wonder how he ended up in this spot, and I wonder um, where he goes for rest. And I'm, so this happened like three or four or five times, and I'm just noticing, and I'm like, this is this is just strange to me. Like, I'm not a cold person, but I normally don't just, like, walk around and feel like my heart is just bleeding over all of these people that I'm, that I'm passing by. And I, I went home, and I sat in my room, and I was thinking about it. And then God showed up, and he said, so, let me take you back to those three months where you were sitting in darkness alone, where you sat there thinking I was abandoning you, that I was avoiding you, that I wasn't speaking to you. Every day you would come in and you would sit down. And as you would sit down, I would reach in and I'd pull out your heart. And for 30 minutes, I'd just massage it. And I'd put it back in and off you went. And you'd come in the next day and I'd pull out your heart and I'd massage it. And I'd put it back in. Now, if you went all this time thinking that I wasn't there, thinking that I wasn't talking, thinking I wasn't answering you, thinking I wasn't telling you what to do, day after day, week after week, you showed up in the dark, and I reached in, and I pulled your heart, and I massaged it. And you better believe after three months of letting me massage your heart, your heart's different. You feel different now. You see people different now. You walk differently. You think differently because you spent three months letting me massage your heart and heal it. And that experience was really I mean, transformative. I would say everything that has come after that in my life, I look back and hinged on the pivot of that. And I am grateful that when God spoke, I backed up and said, I actually don't know what this means. And I'm grateful that I showed up in a way like, it, it was discouraging. I thought about quitting and walking away, and I am so grateful that I didn't, even though I had no idea. But one of the things that it drew to my attention is the way that I think we as Christians often think about darkness may actually be a little different than how God thinks about it. And I started looking at some scriptures. I, I grew up in a space where darkness is the absence of light, and if God is light, then darkness is the absence of God. And so if I'm, in a, if I'm in a season of my life that feels dark, then God must not be here, and I must have done something wrong, and I've stepped out of the will of God, and I've stepped away from the presence of God, and, and that darkness is where evil is. And, and there, is, is, there is evil in darkness, and there is, right, 
to not, to not pull away from any of that. But I started to look at Scripture and what the way that Scripture talks about darkness. And I want to read you a few passages um, of how the Bible talks about darkness and God's relationship to darkness. In Genesis chapter 1, it says, this is the very beginning of our scriptures and our story as the people of God. The earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the water. There was darkness and there was spirit, and from that place came all of creation. From that place came all of creation. Exodus chapter 20 is a, is a, so where it sits in the context of the story is, is the Israelites have been redeemed out of, out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness going to the promised land. Uh, God has invited Moses up onto Mount Sinai in his presence where he's about to give them the Ten Commandments. He's about to give them, hey, this is actually what it means to be my people. He's actually about to, to create a, a covenant with them in that way that says, you walk this way with me, and I'll walk this way with you, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. And in Exodus 20, 21, the scripture reads, then the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness in which God was present. I'm going to read that again. The people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was present. Often, we assume that darkness is where God is not. Scripture would actually say that even in the dark, God is there. Even in the dark, God is present. And the reason this matters is I watch in my own life and I watch in the lives of the people that I walk with that we will be like this when it's sunny and on the beach. Darkness rolls in. Darkness in our lives, darkness in hearing the voice of God, darkness in our own experiences, places of pain and sorrow. Darkness rolls in and we very quickly start to get Mark 15 tells a story uh, of the crucifixion, and there's this place right before Jesus died where the author of Mark said, when it was noon, Jesus is on the cross, on this journey, and gone through the suffering. It says, when it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Darkness rolled in as Jesus is in this moment about to transform history. That Jesus is in this moment about to give us access to the very person and presence of God. His darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and our access to the presence of God was restored. Genesis describes darkness preceding creation. Exodus describes darkness housing the presence of God as the Israelites were about to be formed as a new people. Mark talks about darkness preceding restoration and life and the new creation being given to us and salvation being offered. And he's not talking about darkness as these being evil, awful places to avoid. That actually the gospel speaks very positively about the disciples in the women who stayed at the foot of the cross while the darkness rolled in, while all of the other disciples ran and scattered and could not be found, that there were a handful of people who stayed at the cross, at the foot of the cross, as the darkness rolled in, because even here, Jesus is. Jesus didn't go anywhere when that darkness came over, that actually the darkness was speaking to the event that was happening. That the entrance of darkness into our lives is not a reflection of the absence of God. But Exodus says the thick darkness where the presence of God was. And the people stayed away and Moses entered in. Oh, Jesus, how often do I stay away from your presence? Because the darkness is scary. Mm. Psalm 139 says, 
And in, in this psalm, this is one of my favorite psalms where the psalmist is talking about the incredible breadth and depth and power and where God is everywhere. And he, he writes this. He says, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light to you. And it was coming out of that season where I sat in that chapel in the dark, hearing nothing, seeing nothing, thinking that nothing was happening. And it was coming out of that that I read this psalm. And I found myself, you know how sometimes we read and we kind of like fill in the words before they get there? And so I was so like, when it, when it came to like, even the darkness is not dark to you, what I was anticipating was saying, for you bring light into the dark. What I was anticipating was almost like God shows up and he turns on the lights and now we're not in the dark. But what the psalmist says is actually, even the dark isn't dark to you, which is this kind of poetic way of saying you see in the dark. You see in the dark. And I sat there in the dark in that chapel all of those months, unable to see. Couldn't see a thing. We sang in our song tonight, uh, faith is not by sight, but by your spirit. Which makes a whole lot of sense if we may not be able to see in the dark, but we have a God who can. And if we have a God who can see in the dark, when we enter moments of darkness, or we find ourselves in moments of darkness, where we are tended to pull ourselves back into our little protective cocoon, which means that once again, we're no longer seeing the heart of God for us. We're no longer seeing the people that are around us. We start to fear and accuse God and question God and question ourselves and maybe I never met God and all of the places that we go in our minds when darkness is because we can't see anything. And Jesus would say, I'm right here. I am right here. Psalm 91 says, You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, Shadow. Bright or dark? Dark. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That psalmist is identifying that actually the shadow of God is this dark place that is actually the closest place That the shadow of God in this moment, the darkness of the presence of God is our refuge and our strength. That actually as we draw near to God, as we stay right behind it, the darkest place of the shadows is the part that is closest to the one casting. The further away, the more light there is. The further away, the less dark it is. So sometimes it gets really dark and we get scary and go, let's go find the light. And we're in the light that... God brings, we're just actually not as close to Jesus. Darkness is an invitation. And I'm not talking about the darkness of sin and the darkness of evil. And, uh, just, just to be really clear, I'm talking about the way when life gets hard and it feels like the lights are out. That there is an experience that we have of going, this is dark and this is scary and God must not be here. And we get scared. We get scared of the dark, and we protect ourselves. And Scripture would tell us, fear not, for the presence of the Lord is here. My spirit is here. Even the darkness is not dark to me. So walk closely with me. Let my shadow fall over you and protect you. Be near to me. And I'm going to bring us to a, a landing place here in this. But there's a couple reasons why I think this is really important. One, because when we move into a place where we're protecting ourselves, we just don't experience the life and the connection that God has for us. But also, when we move into a place where we're protecting ourselves, the people around us don't get to experience that either. If Jesus is in you, and if Jesus is in me, then for the people around me, when I move to a place where I begin to protect myself, they don't get to see the heart of Jesus either because I block it off from them. 
And if I'm in a storm and I get scared and I protect myself, I actually remove access for someone else being able to see Jesus in my life. So yes, it is about us and it is about our freedom. And it is about our children and our partner and our parents and our friends and our community. And Jesus is in you and is inviting us to walk in a way of connection. And these moments of storm, and these moments of darkness that we fear, because they're scary. They're disruptive. It's not like we're not sitting here going, yeah, storms don't actually happen. Why do we? No, they, they do. Jesus said it very clearly. In this world, you will have trouble. And then later on, he said, but I am with you always. There will be storms, and I am with you. I actually brought a cushion. I'm with you. I'm playing for this. Yes, there will be darkness of my presence will be thick in it. Um, a few months ago, my, I have two daughters, and my oldest was about three and a half at the time. Um, she was, my wife was putting her down for nap time, and they were talking about turning lights off and darkness and the dark room, and she's kind of in a spot of trying to figure out, does she like more light? Does she like less light? Like, what does that mean? Um, and so she was talking about it, and, she, and my wife told my daughter, hey, you should, you should ask your daddy about if he likes darkness. Because the joke, literally, how I process things is I think now, now because of chapel experience and going, man, this is a spot that, that actually Jesus bypasses all of my head and my thinking and all the ways that I'll spin myself up, and Jesus just goes right to my heart. Now actually the place of greatest grounding for me is to sit in a spot where I intentionally choose to turn off all the lights and say, God, would you just help my heart? So I sit, I literally sit in the dark all the time. I mean, I have messages like this where I go, like, I actually, God is in a lot of places. But my, so my wife and my daughter were having this conversation, and so my wife was like, hey, you should, you should ask your dad if, if he likes to sit in the dark. And so I got home, and we're at, we're at dinner, and my wife kind of nudges my daughter, and what was that question when I asked daddy? And so, so my daughter looks at me, and she goes, daddy, do you like to sit in the dark? And I was like, yeah, that, you're right. I, I, yeah, I like to sit in the dark a lot. And she asked me, she looked at me, and she's thinking about it. She goes, do you want to sit in the dark with me? I was like, yes. <laughs> right? Y yes, I do. And then, and then she asked me this question. And I started to cry because at three and a half, she had no idea what she was asking, but may it be found to be true. She looked at me, and she said, Daddy, do you want to hold my hand? And walk into my darkness with me? Daddy, do you want to hold my hand and walk into my darkness with me? When we are scared of the dark, because we believe that God is not there, because we believe that it's a marker of absence or of pain or of something that is wrong, and we protect ourselves, when someone comes alongside of us, said, will you hold my hand and walk into my darkness with me? And we are scared of our dark, which means that we're going to be scared of their dark. And instead of walking with them into the presence of God, we stay as far away from darkness, which means they do too. So part of why we look at these experiences and say, okay, where where am I living in the freedom that Jesus has brought, has brought life for me to live in? Where are the places, where are the storms that are causing me to start to protect myself where I actually need to go find my pillow and watch the storm with Jesus? Where are the places where though God has made me to walk in connection and freedom, it's starting to get a little dark? And I'm starting to get a little scared. And instead of grabbing hold of a hand, I start to back away. And there's an invitation to say, where are these places in our life? And inviting God to actually bring our own attention to it. Because I, I think what I, what I find often is I don't actually even always, I'm not even always aware when I've moved from this place to this place. And actually, I, I would say that most of, I, I work with a lot of people who are um, ex-evangelicals, people who were in the church and have left the church. And when I actually hear the stories, 
of why they're no longer part of Christian community, the reason is usually become because Christians think that they're like this when they're actually like this. They say, hey, Jesus came to bring you life, but I'm not touching your darkness. Jesus came to calm your storms, but I'm freaking out in mine. And there's this invitation to go, yeah, if, if we're scared and we're guarding ourselves, yeah, people in our churches are not going to see the heart of God in us. They're going to see our hands up. They're going to see us walking away. They're gonna see, yeah, it makes sense why people feel beat up by the church. We're scared of the dark. I'm scared of mine. I'm scared of yours. I'm not touching it. If I'm freaking out in a storm, like in the midst of a storm when we're panicking, that's not usually when our like hands are most gentle on each other's shoulders. Right, if I'm freaking out that I'm about to be thrown overboard, that's not usually where I'm like, hey. <laughs> right? Like that's yeah, we freak out. So I want to give leave you with with four practices that you might find helpful. And I have I have this there's a journal that I made that that guides through these a little bit more. Um, that allow us to attend to are there places where I've actually moved from a place of connection and openness to a spot where I'm protecting myself. So it's called the slow journal because slow is the acronym for these four practices. I'm just going to go through them real quick so you, you are familiar. The S stands for survey. And survey is the question, where am I? And it's really this question of am I here or am I here? In my marriage, where am I? Am I here or am I here? At work, where am I? Am I here or am I here? With my kids, where am I? With my friends, where am I? With Jesus, where am I? Am I here? And so then we survey. We say, where am I? The L stands for lament. And lament is this question. What's hurting that's actually getting me to move from the way that God has made me to live to a place where I'm not here? So if I'm noticed and I survey, where am I? Okay, I'm actually like this in my marriage. Okay, well, what's hurting in my marriage? that is actually causing me to withhold God's heart for my partner from my partner. There's a pain there. Because we, we we're not born like this. As my, my kids didn't come into the world like, get away from me. I mean, screaming as they're trying to like discover a whole world that is mind-blowing, yes. But actually, we were created for this. So if we find, where am I? I go, man, I'm doing this in a few places. Okay, so what hurts? So we lament. We actually were like, that's real. Like, where is the storm? It's a real storm. Where is the darkness? It's real darkness. We get to feel the ways we feel about that. That we're not pretending that away and going like, oh, the sun is always shining. The water is always calm. It's, it's not. So, so we survey and say, where am I? We lament to go, okay, what's, what's the hurt that's causing me to, to close up? The O stands for own. And this is really significant because when we begin to protect ourselves, it always breaks relationships that there are people who are waiting for our embrace, who are needing our embrace, who we withhold our heart from, that we actually fight and we should be loving, that there is always harm done to others when we move from a place of connection to protection, which is why our world isn't getting any better because one person will protect and then the next person feels hurt because our arms are up and so now, now we just live in a world that just walks around like this and we wonder like, why aren't we more deeply connected? Yeah, because it's really scary to go whether or not you're harming me, I need to own that I'm protecting myself. I need to own that. So, yeah, I've shifted in this place. So we survey, where am I? We lament, we say what's hurting. We own, how is the thing that I'm doing negatively impacting, blocking the gospel of Jesus, inhibiting my freedom, someone else's freedom? And the W stands for welcome. And the welcome is the question, what is the invitation of the Spirit in this moment? And maybe the invitation is going, man, I've, I've been protecting myself and I've actually been hurting some people. Maybe the invitation is actually go and confess and to repent of that, to that. Maybe it's the recognition that, man, I am in a storm and I'm trying to convince Jesus to calm my storm and the invitation is to go find my partner. Or maybe... Find ourselves and it's in the dark and go, I'm trying to run from the dark. And Jesus is saying, why don't you come sit with me in it? And let me just hold your hand as we walk into it. So we survey, we lament, we own, we welcome. 
you don't need the journal to do those things. If you are someone who, like having prompts is helpful, it's on Amazon, you can get it. If that's something that would be useful to you, it's just called the slow journal. Um, but can I pray for us as we close? And then, and then you can, when you, if there's a, a sense of what you want to, sh- yeah, okay. Uh, Jesus, thank you for this moment, for these people. Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Jesus, forgive me for moments where I avoid your presence because it's dark and scary. Where I miss out on sitting with you because I get scared. Jesus, may your spirit, even as it has been, may you continue to draw to our attention the invitation that you have for each of us. God, invitation to re-engage connection with you and invitation to re-engage connection with others that we would be whole people holding the whole gospel, being fully and wholly transformed to bring you into our lives and the lives of those around us. Jesus, I pray that in the gracious time, gentle darkness entering, those sitting near you, Jesus,